Welcome back to another Cointelegraph crypto market update. I'm your host, Jackson. Today, I'm talking to Marcel Petschman, one of Cointelegraph's very own crypto market analysts. We're going to discuss the main reasons why ETH made new all-time highs this week, and we'll also look at why this could be the launching point for ETH to $5,000. Let's get into it. Hey, Marcel, great to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Hi, Jackson. Fine. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, I'm really excited about the stuff we're about to talk about. Some great movements in the markets this week. Ethereum's breaking all-time highs all over the place. I think it just pushed above $3,500. In one of your articles, you cited two key metrics that prove pro traders are behind ETH's recent movements. Could you explain your reasoning in further detail? Okay. Um, so one of the main metrics that I use to measure, to measure uh, if uh, pro traders are uh, bullish or bearish is the futures premium. Uh, so we have two kind of futures contracts. The first one is the perpetual one, which doesn't expire. And they have the funding rate every eight hours, which is mostly used by retail traders. And the second one is the contract that expire every three months. So when it gets to the end of the month, the last Friday, the contract settles and it lo no longer exists. Uh, because, of it, because of the fact that it doesn't have a funding rate, their prices uh, uh, differ vastly from the regular spot exchange. So the more overheated the market is, the higher the futures uh, uh, for June and September are trading. And what I've been seeing for Ethereum over the past month uh, is that those futures, uh, which are mostly used by pro traders, uh, have been trading with a 22 to 23% annualized premium, uh, which means the market has been heated for quite some time, even before hitting $3,000. On the other hand, when we focus on the retail focused, uh, uh, retail oriented contracts, the perpetual contracts, uh, we can measure uh, how bullish or bearish they are by using the funding rate, which is the rate that we've talked about that's charged every eight hours. And the funding rate over the past week or 10 days for Ethereum has been mostly fat, like 0.03% every eight hours, which means like 3% uh, per month or nothing unusual for Ethereum. So it tells me that uh, pro traders have been bullish for quite some time, over a couple of weeks, while the retail traders are still waiting for a, a, a buy opportunity. So the institutions are trading the futures, the retailer are trading the perp swap, and essentially the difference in those prices when compared to the spot, especially in the futures, shows that the institutions are very bullish at the moment and are buying a lot, whereas retail is just kind of waiting to see what happened essentially is what you're saying right yeah, the the, re the retail is more uh how can i say they're always waiting for a dip to buy nobody wants to pay the all-time high so this is reflected on on the perpetual uh funding the perpetual funding rate every eight hours they're not optimistic right now even though Ethereum is the, at, at all-time high and doesn't seem like it's going to stop anytime soon. Uh, if, you, uh, if you also check the on-chain data, which shows the withdrawals from exchange, large withdrawals from exchange, like indicating that it's institutional clients, it's heavy clients, it's arbitrage, it's whales, it's market makers, they're withdraw withdrawing from exchanges, maybe placing that uh, Ethereum on DeFi, decentralized finance looking for better yields but if there's less ethereum at the exchanges there's less there's less offer so if buyers come in there's less to be offered and this creates this creates a, a, a upwards pressure for price so so you're saying that um that the institutions are essentially kind of starving the exchanges and that lack of supply in the exchanges is driving up the price right now yeah there are two or three main factors factors behind it. The first is the staking for Ethereum 2.0. So large, you, you needed like 32 Ethereums to become a validator. Uh, so large clients started doing the, converting their Ethereum 1.0 into 2.0 and sending it to, for staking on the new network. 
And there's also the DeFi opportunities, either doing uh, yield farming uh, or simply sending to a, a loan and borrow application such as Compound or Balancer. So uh, these guys are getting better yields, better returns for the deposits outside of exchanges. So yeah, it's creating an uh, it's 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 making it more illiquid for the for the new guys who are trying to get in the market and buy Ethereum. So it creates an upwards pressure. Mm -hmm. And do you see this trend continuing? Oh, definitely. Uh, it's never a good idea to bet against big money. And uh, as long as the DeFi and automated market making strategies are yielding up 20 percent or higher in US dollar. These guys, these guys are going to continue to flock the market and fl to flood the market. And for an uh, institutional client to buy 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars in Ethereum, it, it's, it's nothing for them. And it makes a huge impact on price. People have the wrong idea that uh, for Ethereum market cap to go from 300 billion to 400 billion dollars, there needs to be you know, half a billion of inflow in Ethereum. That's not true. Sometimes uh, five clients buying uh, uh, $50 million each, it's going to make the, the market capitalization go from $300 billion to $400 billion because the percentage of, uh, uh, of stock effectively changing hands, it's like 10% of the stock or 15% because the other part is uh, held at cold wallets, at decentralized finance. The, the TVL of decentralized finance has surpassed $100 billion. So most of the Ethereum is not circulating, it's not being bought and sold at the exchanges. That's so yeah, the trend should continue. But I want to touch on another one of your articles that you wrote in which you said that the Ethereum bulls are in full control of this week's options expiry. And could you explain the significance of this and what it means for the price of ETH heading into next week even? Okay. So Jackson, let's first explain for our viewers the difference between uh, options and futures. In futures markets, at all times, buyers, the longs, and the seller shorts are matched at all times. There's no way for the, 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 the buyers to be higher or sellers to be stronger than the, the buyers. Uh, what can change is the how leverage each side using. So this leverage imbalance, you can see the difference uh, by the perpetual funding rate, the, the, the fee charged every eight hours. In the option markets, it's completely different. There are two kinds of options that are completely separate. They don't need to be balanced. The first one is the call option, which gives you the buyer the right to acquire an asset in the future. For example, Ethereum is trading at $3,500,000. And I think it's going to be at $5,000 by year end. So what I can do is I buy a $4,000 call option. So I have the right to acquire Ethereum for $4,000 in December. For, for this right, I pay an upfront for the seller. Okay, I'll pay you $500 now. So in December, if I want, I can pay fixed price $4,000 for Ethereum. So that's the call option. On the other hand, we have the put option, which is usually used for uh, hedging strategies. The buyer has the right to sell Ethereum. So I can buy a protective put for $2,500,000. So in June or September or December, if I choose so, uh, if Ethereum is trading at $2,000, I have the right to sell it for $2,500,000. It's a fixed price and I pay an upfront for this. So what happened for, the exp for this Friday's expiry on May 7th is that the price increased so much that all of these protective options were, were priced below $2,800. No one was expecting uh, uh, the price to go that, that higher. So every, every option trader that bought a protective option, it's now, this option is now worthless. Uh, nobody wants to sell Ethereum at $2,500 or $2,600 if it's trading at $3,400. So on the other hand, everybody that has been bullish on Ethereum using options, Let's say he bought an option to buy at $3,000. He's going to exercise it. Uh, I mean, he's going to want to buy the Ethereum, paying $3,000 fixed, 
and then maybe he's selling the market for $3.5,000 or holding it, but he's going to exercise his buy option. He's going to buy, he's going to, he's going to make the seller buy Ethereum. So this puts a, a upwards pressure on the price because the sell options, the put options are dead. They're all from 2.8,000 and below. While all, the, almost the majority of the buy options are still good and they're gonna be exercised. If you have the right to, to buy Ethereum for $2.7,000, dollars you are gonna use it for sure. And the seller needs to give you the, the Ethereum. So mm -hmm. it puts a, a upward pressure for Friday's expiry on May 7th. So is that upward pressure already being priced in right now or are, will there still be, you think, some more significant movements to come because of this upward pressure later this week? Uh, options, the one that we usually trade on, on Deribit and OKX, they're called European options. So they can only be settled at the expiry. You cannot call the, 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 the option seller two days ahead and say, well, I want to liquidate my position. Mm -hmm. If you want, you can sell it in the market if there are buyers for it. So you lock the profits in. But the majority of the options, people just wait for the last day. So yeah, over the last 12 hours of the expiry, which happens at 8 a.m. UTC, United Clock, uh, on Friday. So there's still room for upward pressure on Friday morning. Mm -hmm. So on Friday, we're going to see a large amount of buying pressure come into the market yeah. from all of those options being exercised. Got it. Um, and then, I mean, looking to next week, um, do you see this like, do you see the buying pressure continue upward or you think we're going to see like a big spike on Friday and then it's probably going to do some sort of correction? What, what are your thoughts on that? It's very early to tell, mm -hmm. uh, but if I were a, a bear, a, a bear, Ethereum bear, uh, I would probably wait for the end of month to try to put in a, a downwards pressure because right now the momentum is re really good to Ethereum. So I don't think they're going to try to fight for the next week as well. They, they lost this one. They got sla slaughtered. The bears got killed. But it's going to stay like this for, I don't know, a month, a couple of weeks until this institu institutional guys are buying. Get out of the way. Don't short it. You're going to get killed. Got it, got it, got it. And then we could probably expect some kind of correction uh, when, the, when, when those institutions settle down or no? No, because uh, unlike retail guys, these institutionals, as we've seen on Bitcoin, uh, they bought all the way from 40,000 to 60,000. Mm -hmm. But they, they will stay buying orders at, at 50,000, for example. So if the market drops like 10, 15, 20%, they'll be back buying for more. Sure. Got so it. it's a different animal, I would say. Uh, like what I've seen at, at the cryptocurrencies at, at the end of 2017, the beginning of 2018, that we saw the retail FOMO, then the market dropped 20% and the guys just market sold. Then the, the market dropped 30%, and guys just market sold. So in one month, you saw a 60% correction. I don't think that's going to happen any longer. Uh, as long as these institution, institutions continue buying, they will just average pricing. So if the price drops 20%, they'll be buying more. As I said, a 20 million, $50 million buy order for these guys is nothing. Got it. Um, any final remarks you have about the current state of the market right now? Yeah, I think there's a huge uh, question mark that's open for this month, May, uh, happening in a couple of weeks. Uh, that is the IFINX tether deadline. So they settled uh, with DOJ, the Department of Justice of New York, three months ago, they paid a $18 million, $19 million fine. Uh, but they agreed to every three, mo three months to give a statements to show uh, how, where the, the, where the $50 billion of money that they have is invested at, what kind of assets those are. And uh, if, if in X, and Tether uh, fail to provide this to the DOJ, it's going to be a problem. Uh, definitely it's going to be a problem. I'm not saying that Tether is the most relevant uh, altcoin or stablecoin, uh, but it, yeah, it, it has an impact on uh, cryptocurrency valuation in general. So it could be bad. So as in like, um, 
if some if Tether inaccurately reported or um, the DOJ found some discrepancies, they could lock up Tether's liquidity and it would kind of just jam up the entire crypto space. Is that essentially what would happen? It's going to create a huge problems for uh, exchanges that are heavily dependent on Tether, mm -hmm. uh, namely OKX, uh, Huobi, Binance. Uh, out of the exchanges that are 70% or 80% of the volume are tether based, they could have problems, uh, liquidity problems. So I don't know, I think the market is overlooking this issue. Uh, maybe it's a 5% risk of DOJ saying, well, I don't agree with these numbers. Uh, I'm gonna sue you or I'm gonna halt all your transactions for a month. It, it's a risk. I don't know if, if, if it's 3% risk, 10% risk, 15% risk, but it, market is overlooking at it, for sure. Yeah, well, for all those watching, make sure you stay tuned in to Cointelegraph because as soon as we have some news on that, we'll make sure to cover it. I suggest people to, to continue looking at uh, skew.com, bybt.com for the funding rate, for the three months premium, because those are the indicators that will tell you in advance uh, if pro traders continue buying Ethereum or not. Uh, this rally could sustain until $5,000 easily. Don't bet against it. It's large clients. They're uh, withdrawing from exchanges. We're seeing uh, $100 million and plus uh, movements on chain. So this could continue for a long time. Thank you for all that amazing insight, Marcel. Thank you, Jackson, for uh, the opportunity. Great to, to be here. Thank you, everyone, for watching. That was Marcel, who is a market analyst at Cointelegraph. If you enjoyed the show, please hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you all next time.